Hello everyone. Welcome to the 10:30 a.m. session of the 2015 Open Simulator Community Conference. As a reminder to our in-world and web audience, you can view the full conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org and tweet your questions or comments to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC15. This hour, we are happy to introduce a terrific session called A Dimension Beyond. Our speakers today are Myron Curtis and Steve Levine. Myron will be speaking first. Myron Curtis is the founder and developer of Virtual Worlds Grid. Throughout his life, Myron Curtis has been involved with the evolution of digital technology. He still has his dad's TS-1000 home computer its manuals and program cassettes that he played games on as a child. He has taught computer science at Butte Community College in the last past 12 years and has been building virtual worlds since 2006 and now owns Virtual Worlds Grid. Steve Levine is the CFO or Secretary Treasurer of A Dimension Beyond Incorporated. He has been actively involved in virtual worlds and virtual reality since 2007. He has set up many open sim servers all over the world and has regions in OS Grid, Metropolis, the Angel Fire Grid, and Virtual Worlds Grid. He is active in the Mosers Project. He is a strong advocate of going a dimension beyond and using virtual technology to help many types of people with special needs. Welcome, and let's begin the session. Thank you for having us. Uh, it's really an honor to be here, and uh, there are some names in the audience alone that uh, really are people who built virtual worlds, especially OpenSim. What we're going to be talking about is blending uh, virtual reality with machine intelligence and human intelligence, and how that's going to be affecting our day-to-day -day life over the, the rest of the future, actually. <clears throat> now, the people who are going to sit there and say, well, we haven't decided if we should do that yet. Unfortunately, that discussion took place about 20 years ago. What we need to be doing now is discussing how we manage it and make sure that we do it right this time, because otherwise we might just end up building the matrix, which probably should scare the hell out of everybody. Um, no, it scares me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It scares me, too. So anyway, uh, machine intelligence is what I prefer to use as opposed to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence tends to sound like uh, something out of science fiction that's evil and terrible and is going to eat us alive. Um, machine intelligence is probably more accurate. Uh, we, we at A Dimension Beyond are actually working on uh, projects that uh, will blend virtual reality with uh, machine intelligence to help people manage their lives. And it's going to be exciting stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, let's check. <laughs> I've got a little, I'll, I'll say the next thing here. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, basically, what, I'm not sure whether you said this completely right, but over the next 20 years, people who cannot or will not use machine intelligence will be more and more likely to be considered considered handicapped and will be regulated to lower paying jobs, if any at all. Basically, what's going to happen is our world's going to be a whole lot more connected. Our real life and our virtual life will be a whole lot more connected uh, because we'll be schooled in virtual worlds, we'll be... Uh, We'll be doing our offices in virtual worlds. Uh, we'll be shopping in virtual worlds. Uh, so basically, if you're not in that, uh, I'm not going to use the word matrix. Uh, if you're not in that, you, uh, <laughs> you're not going to be uh, where you need to be, basically. Uh, sure. The other thing is, is now that more than ever, organizations reply upon their data to make informed decisions that can affect millions of lives and billions of dollars in revenue. You notice everybody's watching you now. What, it, what you click on and where you go and what you say is very important to them because they want to sell you something. Uh, the collection and analysis of data from transactions, sensors, and biometrics continues to grow at a prodigious rate, taxing the analytic capabilities of even the most sophisticated organizations, except for maybe Google and Microsoft. Uh, well, them too. 
you know, and the quantity of possible insights in a given data set is exponential. You know, the number of data points uh, is incredible. On top of this, you know, you aggregate data growth. Uh, it's an exponential function as well. And unfortunately, we don't have the ability to train enough data scientists to meet that runaway double exponential demand curve. And quite frankly, I'm not sure people themselves could do it without machine intelligence to augment their abilities. You know, um, there's a lot of potential for uh, abuse in there. And we recognize that. We're looking for ways as we build our tools to uh, mitigate that problem. But it's the problem with all security is that uh, you never are going to be completely secure. So it's, it's going to be uh, a challenge, to say the least, to make sure that the privacy is protected. But then a lot of people right now would probably tell you that uh, privacy is pretty much an illusion right now anyway. You know, <clears throat> uh, this is driving scientists and mathemat mathematicians to ex examine new approaches to improve both quantity and the quality and the speed of their analytics engines. Today's hypothesis-driven analytics are not going to suffice. High-performance machines and algorithms can examine data in a far more quickly, and they can examine more complex data than we're capable of now. And eventually, they'll be able to uh, create insights <clears throat> more comprehensively than they are doing now. So we need By to the, find exponential invest improvements. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Tom came up with a good thing uh, here about the privacy thing about Ghostry. I use that, and it's really quite good. And uh, you see a big list of things that are not being sent off to, which is kind of comforting if it actually is working. Uh, yeah, that's the, good. <laughs> the next thing we got to talk about is avatar is machine uh, intelligence interface. There's an interesting set of words to get out. Um, so how do we show that blending real life virtual worlds and machine intelligence is how we can best and how can we best utilize these tools? One of the things we're working on right now, our very first project is an HTML5 viewer, basically viewer in a browser. It's something that everybody wants and everybody isn't fully sure that they uh, need it yet, but that's the way things are gonna end up going in the future because then more people can get in and actually use uh, Open Simulator. Uh, yeah, especially since you realize that that's the only way we're going to have people with phones and tablets able to access these worlds. And since that's where our computers are going, that's where Open Simulator and machine intelligence is going to have to go as well. The, the other thing is, is a virtual uh, world viewer in a browser pretty much eliminates the problem of uh, different operating systems. If it works in a particular browser, it'll work in a particular browser, that particular browser on any operating system. So right now, basically Firefox and Chrome are the, the best bets, but the others are coming up to it. And sure. uh, we want to see it work on everything, right down to the cheapest phone and the cheapest tablet. Right, and it also solves a lot of accessibility problems because it's easier for people with uh, screen readers and things like that to uh, use those tools for their own um, benefit. Um, so, let's see. Okay, next up is yeah. <laughs> virtual experience, yeah. <laughs> Everybody really wants to go. You know, what we plan to do is have our um, machine intelligence represented by an avatar that's extremely portable. The avatar can move from device to device. It can be hooked up to the Internet of Things, so it can help people manage um, their own homes or even their own businesses. Um, it, um, it'll run on almost any device because it's actually being streamed to the device as opposed to being run on the device. And it'll be able to use uh, virtual reality for a more real experience. In fact, it can kind of be your uh, store clerk, if you like, you know, which brings us to the whole experience of online business. Right now, you go shopping online, and it's a very lonely little thing to do because it's not like going into a real store where you have your friends with you and you can kind of egg each other on to 
you know, buy that new metal detector or for women to buy, you know, uh, whatever they're looking for together and having fun. Uh, with virtual reality, uh, with the ability to shop together, for example, you can go into, say, a clothing store and buy um, virtual clothes that fit your avatar, but since your avatar is built to scale to your real life body, you order those real clothes as well, and you know they're going to fit, and you know what they're going to look like. And you can get comments right away back. You know, exactly. if you look really terrible in that outfit, hopefully your friend will tell you. Uh, uh, they might not. <laughs> For but, me, uh, yeah, we're we're thinking that there needs to be more of a blending here. Right now, uh, when we deal with virtual worlds, virtual worlds are a very niche thing. When I talk to people about virtual worlds and things like that, they always kind of give me this dumb look like, huh? And so I have to start showing them. So I end up giving a lot of tours of different sims we have. Uh, the reason being is, is it's not something that's coming into everybody's life. It's not uh, yes. hitting them yet. I would say within the next five years, though, you're going to see a dramatic expanse of that. And that's why we're saying it's like Open Simulator needs to keep up with that. Uh, we're getting there, but I get that feeling we're getting there a little too slowly in some ways. Uh, right. This is part of what uh, a Dimension Beyond is planning to do, is we want to get first the viewer in a browser working. And then after that, then we start adding on different things to it. The viewer in the browser is going to be very simple for people who need it very simple, and it can be very... Uh, advanced for people that needed to be advanced. It's basically just a web page. Doesn't make any big thing. Mm -hmm. So this is where we're going in uh, these kind of things. Uh, Myron, you got anything more to say here? Well, yeah. You know, the, um, probably one of the driving forces behind uh, using virtual reality is going to be the healthcare industry. Well, uh, Kyle Gomboy down in Florida, who uh, basically started Reaction Grid, has gone on to other things, and he's shown a couple times with some of his projects since then that you can actually um, send data out of an open sim virtual reality and send things to like uh, 3D printers. Uh, there's no reason why we can't have an interactive um, relationship, say, with a doctor and a patient where the telemetry they're looking for is actually displayed in world and the fact that we have so many ways of interpreting uh, the data and the language that people are speaking we could actually have a patient displayed in a virtual world with several doctors from around the world speaking different languages understanding each other as they diagnose the problems that this patient is experiencing so th there's a lot of potential here um, I do a lot of meetings and conferences in real life I would love for those people to start doing those things on virtual worlds. I really do not like flying from one end of California to the other all the time. I end up feeling like I'm wasting hours instead of getting things done while I'm on the plane or in the airports. We all know that virtual worlds would be great for that. Um, the, the perfect in, Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say the perfect example is right here in OSCC. Yeah, exactly. Now. Think of the fact that, you know, maybe some of the avatars out here are not real people. We have a resident in Virtual Worlds Grid who brings his friend in once in a while, and his friend is a digital being. Uh, I believe her name is Allison Prime. She has a website, and she's a machine learning entity. Um, I could easily see her being used as a store clerk. We have a lot of bots in virtual worlds, and they're pretty amazing, actually, but they're nowhere near the quality that we could have. Yeah. <laughs> Some people are telling me they're real people. I'm not sure that I am. Uh, well, I was going to say, I was wondering about that myself, actually, at times. <laughs> um, the uh, When it comes to the viewer in the browser, I would say we're pretty close. As a matter of fact, Myron, while we were waiting for doing this presentation, he was busily coding up a storm and sent me a link that does some things. <laughs> and uh, so we're kind of, we're, we're getting there. Part of our big problem is time. We need time and we need more help. 
uh, if anybody would love to get together with us, we need people who can help us in many different ways. Uh, and don't hesitate to contact us. There's the little spinny cube over here. If you click on that, you'll get a link to our booth here, and you'll also get uh, contact information for me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's an undercurrent to all of what we're doing as well. Um, right now, we're expecting uh, machines to kind of help us um, learn better and do things more quickly. They're kind of considered an external resource that we will work with. But Steve and I both strongly suspect, and there's a lot of people who agree with us, that at some point in time, we will start to absorb each other. We're seeing some amazing things happen with prosthetics. There are people who uh, are able to control prosthetics with thought processes and muscle uh, tension. Uh, that's going to change to the point where the prosthetics will be uh, indistinguishable from a real limb, you know, in terms of the experience of the user. Um, we may even go to the point where we're enhancing ourselves. So in some ways, we are really at the cusp of designing our own evolution. So it's really important for people to start getting involved in what we do with this and where we go with it. So we're hoping that what we've done today is kind of a blown your minds a little bit and got you to, to think outside of the box and realize that maybe the box is a toy box. <laughs> yep, we need to get out of the toy box, heaven forbid. Uh, next slide up, anybody got questions they want us to answer? I'll just be reading here in local chat. I like that thing about the language. Well, you were putting in the same links I was, Steve. Thanks. I was, yeah. I, <laughs> little do you know. I no questions. I'm... Hmm. Give it a little more time. I bet somebody come up with one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, somebody wanted the links. That's good. They're all, all bots, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we just didn't scare them all away. Well, well. it's a bit scary in the video, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the thing is, is if you're uh, really interested in talking about this more, just come over and see us at the booth. Uh, we'll be over there uh, this afternoon and or today and tomorrow. There uh, is a big question in here. Oh, we do uh, have working on the ethics here. This is something we've discussed quite um, extensively in our company. Um, we're we're actually thinking of bringing in a group of uh, ethics experts, including clergy from different uh, faiths and uh, you know um, people who have uh, doctorate's degree in um, sociology and things like that. We're not really sure who else would be involved in that, but that's definitely something we want to get right the first time. Yeah, that's that's a very, very important thing. Myron and I have talked about that almost ad nauseum. Um, how long, what time frame do you see this technology rolling out? Uh, I would say one to two years. If uh, We're in the process of working on grants right now, getting grants to get money to be able to pay some high-level coders. And uh, we, we figure probably a couple of years for our beginnings of it. Uh, our virtual, our viewer in a browser should come out within the next couple of months in a very alpha for, version. We're not talking long down the road. Uh, this is something that's going to start happening. Uh, we have already yeah. asked Ian Watson. <laughs> Lionel is talking about 1984, and that is my biggest concern. I'm very anti people spying on people and stuff like that. Uh, that's why I use all the different things I do, like ghostry, because I just can't I can't handle that. Serene has a good point. That's exactly we want people that would be 
from all areas that would have something to say about this. Mm. Yeah, probably even government. Uh, you know, I'm sure the military has their own version of it. I'm not sure I want to be involved in that just yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, the other thing, too, it says, how would we know when it's going to be out? Well, uh, you're going to start seeing us talking about it a whole lot more all over the place. Um, probably uh, Hypergrid Business would maybe be the first where Maria would get an interview with us when we actually have something and it'd have a link that you could go to and try it out. Yeah, that may be soon, I hope. Uh, fuel and energy implications? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's... Because people will have to travel less, we're already going to mostly online shopping. People order their groceries online. Um, a uh, machine intelligence driven avatar that has access to the Internet of Things could be keeping track of the inventory in your refrigerator and automatically ordering things and asking you um, what you want for that week in terms of a menu. You know, so it starts becoming part of your day to day life planning. It what, does save a lot of gas. <laughs> what is the carbon footprint of an avatar? That's an interesting one. <laughs> That's it a hard one to calculate. <laughs> it is hard to calculate because it lives across several machines. But those machines do consume energy. Yeah. This is the key to the whole thing is keeping the humanity in it. Uh, machine intelligence is still machine intelligent. It's kind of like people who play with Siri. Uh, and ask her weird questions, you know, and you get those weird answers back. Uh, it's fun to do, but it also shows the limitations of the, uh, the system as it is now. One of our limitations is the limitations of machinery and computers that we have right now. Because uh, we're, we have to start out in a certain level that will run on the machines that we have now. Uh, eventually, it will keep growing and growing as things get better and better and better. Yeah, I hope so. You know, it's, um, there's always the possibility that people will misuse this, and we're going to have to try to design that into it. <clears throat> and like I said, the problem with any kind of protection security is that people who are trying to secure a system have to watch everything, they have to investigate everything to try to figure out where the next attack could be coming from. The bad guys, all they have to do is focus on one thing. So we're always at a kind of a disadvantage. Well, uh, Rhiannon brought up a good point here. She says, brings up the idea of the future of work and if the world is a place where AI, machine intelligence slash robots take up more jobs, then what do people do for work? What people do for work will evolve. Um, right. uh, the other thing I see happening is, is in a lot of ways, right now we've got a world where everybody kind of fights with each other and we're all worried about each other and it seems to be getting logarithmically worse in the last few years. Uh, the big thing about uh, what we've got going here with Open Simulator and with virtual worlds is, is people get together with each other on a personal level. It's not governments getting together, it's real people getting together. So you can have really wonderful, good friends that you deal with that are located in places you'd never go to physically. Uh, I literally have friends all over the world that I've met through virtual worlds. Our whole company, none of us have met each other in person. We're all people who's met each other in virtual worlds and on Skype. Right. And, you know... Um Stephen, Stephen Myron, I'd like yeah. to encourage you to. We, we're running a little low on time here, so if you could okay, maybe wrap it up a bit, no problem. Thank I you. <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoy, I'm enjoying it myself. Well, <laughs> if you want to continue the conversation, we'll be over at the booth. Uh, we're going to be here for a while because I think uh, one or the other of us is going to be in the next presentation here after the break. But uh, we'll be over at the booth. Just grab the landmark from the spinning cube there and uh, come on over and talk. I'd love, I'm here all day to talk about this. And uh, it's something I love to talk about. <laughs> well, excellent. Thank I thank you. you, Myron and Steve, for a terrific presentation. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. 
Following this session, we have a break in the schedule for lunch or dinner, wherever you may be in the physical world. We will resume at 12 p.m. with the presentation, The Future of Viewer Interfaces. We encourage you to visit the OSCC 15 Poster Expo in the Expo 3 region to find accompanying info on presentations and explore the hypergrid tour resources in OSCC Expo Region 2 along with sponsor and crowdfunder booths located throughout all of the OSCC Expo regions. In addition, if you are a crowdfunder at the exclusive access level or above, you are invited to a VIP Q&A session with today's keynote speakers in the Staff Zone Auditorium at 11.15 a.m. Thank you again to our speakers and to the audience.